You are listening to the FCF Leadership Podcast. This podcast has been created to help you connect and achieve your destiny as a leader. For more information, visit our website at fcf.org. All right, everybody, this is Cookie Brothers here at FCF International with another podcast. And we're excited today because we have Greg and Chris Baca here in the office. Whitney's in here too, but she doesn't have a microphone, so we can torment mercilessly should we choose. But I wanted to have some time with Greg and Krista because uh, we met uh, just this last June, actually, and it was one of those real God connections. Mm -hmm. So aware of what the Lord is doing in your life and ministry and couldn't wait to look for opportunities to partner together, which we are looking at and talking about, and know that there's going to be some amazing things ahead for us. But uh, Greg and Krista are uh, launching a new church here in the Tulsa area, and I want to talk to them about some of that. And they also have had an amazing uh, international mission organization that they've operated for several years as well. They were actually the first ones who took my daughter on a mission trip. (laughs) (laughs) And so uh, the impact was significant then. And so our family has been impacted by their ministry for a long time. Mm -hmm. So Greg and Krista, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us today. (laughs) You're awesome. Well, tell us first about what's happening with the launch of the church and the direction the Lord has had you guys go. Yeah, so this is uh, been quite a process in the making. We are kind of to give you a little bit of context for this specific church that we're launching in downtown Tulsa. Uh, it is actually our second campus. Uh, Chris and I, as you mentioned, we've done missions for years. We started Go International in 2003, uh, taking teams all over the world. And uh, in 2012, we moved to Quito, Ecuador, as, and lived as missionaries for four years down there and launched a church there. And so it was really out of that. And, and Chris and I were the first to tell you, we never imagined ourselves Mm-hmm. planting churches or pastoring like we kind of were we're missions people we you know like I said that's kind of just our, been our passion but it was almost out of uh, we began we planted the church more out of necessity down there as we were doing lots of outreaches and building community and realized that like man we've got to have a place to plug people in and found out that, uh, you know, and honestly for myself, I always, not only did I not see myself as pastoring, it was always one of those things I was like, oh God, please don't make me do that, you know? Ain't that the truth? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so that being said, when we found ourselves pastoring this community down there, we started realizing like, oh, well, like if this is pastoring, like I didn't want to do what I thought it had to look like or what I imagined. Right. Um, but then I realized like, oh, like, this is community, this is a family, this is like we're, we're speaking into people's lives. And it, it looked and felt different than what I perceived or imagined it would. And very quickly we kind of came to realize that, like, man, this is something that we are passionate about. So all of that to say, out of that experience uh, living in South America and pastoring the church down there, we turned it over to our uh, local leaders down in Quito that uh, helped launch it, that you know, we kind of went down and partnered with them to launch it. Turned it over to them in 2016, and when we moved back here, we weren't exactly sure what the next step was that we were to do. We just felt that the Lord said, uh, return to the U.S. and and be in Tulsa, and pretty quickly upon arriving back, just some things began to stir in our hearts, and part of it really was the fact that, you know, we had experienced various cultures around the world. You know, when you show up to a country, there's things that you that are different to you, right? And people talk about it being culture shock. Well, in a certain way, we came back to the U.S. and we were gone long enough to have culture shock coming back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that really informed a lot of what we're doing with this new church plant. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I think our perspective has showed us is that church can look a million different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go from... I mean, we've, whether we've been in remote villages in the world to, you know, big stadiums and auditoriums, like the concept of what church looks like takes on many different forms. Um, but when we came back to the States, 
we kind of felt like we were gone long enough to view things as outsiders, both just as culturally at large for the states, mm-hmm. but also a little bit of church culture mm-hmm. that we were blind to when we were just living here. Right, because it's part of your norm. Right, so it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of like white noise. You don't really see it, you don't question it, but being gone long enough to really come back and, like I said, really experience culture shock. Mm-hmm. both in the church and outside of the church to say like okay like what's um, it caused us to start having conversations and asking questions and really have some things that were stirring in our heart about okay what would it look like if and in a certain way I'd almost say it's the same way we approach raising our children um, that you know our daughter Lucy she was born down in Ecuador uh, so she is you know dual citizen and there are amazing things we love about American culture, and there are amazing things we love about Ecuadorian culture and the Latino culture. Yeah. And we, as a family, try and say, like, man, how do we take the best of both worlds and integrate that into our family? Mm-hmm. And in a certain sense, that kind of informs what we're doing with the, I'd say maybe our DNA of the church that we're launching uh, here in Tulsa is how do we take kind of things that have, maybe impacted us in both nations. And and particularly, I think one of the things that we walked away with from being, uh, living in Ecuador is just the relational aspect, Mm -hmm. you know, as well as when I talk about uh, just culture shock with culture at large, when we lived down there, it was amazing how, one thing we never realized is just the, what we call like the American buzz, the busyness. Like when we'd fly from Ecuador mm-hmm. and we, I mean, literally like that plane landed in Miami, you get off the plane and you just felt a stress that mm-hmm. everybody carried just schedules and mm-hmm. appointments and calendars. And, you know, it's like almost schedule Trump's people mm-hmm. versus living down there is more people Trump's schedule, mm-hmm. people Trump's calendar. And so all of that to say, this was what was happening in the background when we first started to say, what would it look like? If we were to launch a church, what would that feel like? And it was some of those conversations that really we started having two years ago that now as we've been meeting in homes and we've been renovating a building downtown, we're just getting ready to open the doors that have really kind of informed what we're creating. And I, and I think that like as we were considering like, is this something that we want to do? Is this like the next direction that God has for us? I feel like out of the woodwork, just people kept coming to us and they'd be like, I just am longing for community. And and that was something that we had experienced on such a deep level. Like Greg said, it's just inter, it's intertwined to every single moment of of living in a nation like Ecuador such as like lunchtime, you know, what we do on the weekends with our family, they do every day for lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like everybody takes off and they go and they have lunch together and it's this beautiful meal. Mm -hmm. And then what they do on the weekends is more like what we do for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And that happens every single week. And it's, it's friends, it's family. And, and really you get kind of thrown into that because you really wouldn't be respected in the community if you weren't spending time with your family and you weren't making them a priority. And so it kind of really created in us like this shift yeah. towards, you know, we were relational people before we got there, but we delved into a deeper level of relationship. And really, I feel like as we've been planting this, being being at homes, um, having dinners together, we have felt this great sense of community just really th- begin to thrive. You, you know what? This is kind of a big buzzword, if you will, sure. right now, and that's the word community. Yeah. And tell me what that means for you guys in the launch of this church. And by the way, what's the name of the church? It's called One TUL, or One Tulsa. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so it is one of those words that... You know, it, just like anything, you can say a word, mm-hmm. and if you're not living it and demonstrating it, and it's not doesn't have flesh to it, it's just a word. And we talk about this all the time um, with our team. It's like you can put your core values up on a wall, and that's just that's just a poster. It doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. The question is like, how do you flesh that out? Right. What does that actually look like? What does it look like to be 
people centered and community oriented because mm-hmm. just because you have it on a nice flyer or something doesn't yeah i think Amy stanley says um your mission vision core values are what you have on the wall but um your culture is what's happening down so the hall true. yes and so. <laughs> culture exists and that's yeah. really what we've been doing for the past two years and and one of the things that i would just say is like we felt one of the things we felt very strongly about in launching this is we really felt in our heart that we were to not go through a church planting organization um which we kind of there's some part of us wanted to you know there's there's something that's great and and it's we're thankful that those exist yeah right some great we are big believers in systems and Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not having to reinvent the wheel. And that's why it's ultimately important that everybody's being true to what they feel that the Lord is speaking to them. Absolutely. In our case, we felt like we were to not go through a church planting model and kind of create blank canvas in a certain sense. Um, And so that's taken a little bit longer, but part of it too was the thought of like, because there's so many voices and there's so many even experts on this is how you do it. And, and I think the while I'm a systems, uh, a believer in systems, mm-hmm. I think there is some downside to it as well. If everybody's doing the same thing, mm-hmm. if everybody's following the same playbook at a certain time, there has to be there has to be some level of innovation. You can't just continue to follow the same playbook. Mm. Right. Um, and so we really just felt in our heart that we were to kind of say, OK, we're we're going against in a certain sense. Not going against, but we're just not following the playbook of quote unquote experts. We just felt to begin to create in kind of, like I said, blank canvas spaces Mm -hmm. and really get clear about what it is that we felt like we were creating and what the, you know, what the heart and the mission and the focus behind it was. So that being said, like when we started, we started by saying, okay, we're starting. We didn't have budgets for this. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a team. And in a certain sense, I think maybe Ecuador prepared us for this Mm -hmm. because when we moved to Ecuador, we knew a few people. And honestly, like what we felt the direction from the Lord was when we left Tulsa and moved down to Quito, we felt like he said, go to Ecuador and I'll tell you what to do when you get there, Mm -hmm. which we always laugh and say, it's not an incredible fundraising strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, (laughs) trust me, it's going to be awesome. Don't you want to be involved? (laughs) Uh, and it really was. I mean, we had sold everything. We'd been doing ministry for 10 years. We sold everything, reduced it down to two suitcases each. So we had six suitcases for me, Krista, and Zion total. We didn't bring a container down there. We didn't even have our apartment chosen. We just said, we're going. We, we had a bed and breakfast for the first 10 days. And then we said, okay, we'll get down there and we'll find it. And so that experience, and was, you know, we started, that was how we started. And when we left, we had teams in place and... I mean, outreach that was happening throughout the city every week and a church that was functioning and strong. And so I'm a big believer in the in, in just starting. And as much as I am like a like a systems and, you know, strategic planner, I like all of that. There's something to be said for just kind of putting a stake in the ground and saying, OK, we're going we're, we're starting because you never end up where you started. Yeah, exactly. you can navigate. So all of that to say when we started the church. We, it was really just Chris and I saying, like, we're, we're going to do this kind of in a certain sense, mm-hmm. kind of, quote unquote, the old school way. Mm-hmm. Can you just do this and say, like, OK, we're doing this mm-hmm. and we're going to get clear about what we're doing and put that out there. And whoever that resonates with. Mm-hmm. That's we're just going to trust that God brings the right people to be our core team. Um, the one question I have about community, yeah. what yeah. that means for you guys, when yeah. you say community and people that have come to you and said, we've been looking for community, what did that mean to you all? Well, I think if I can, I think that, um, for us, community has to be lived by example. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there's a big difference between popularity, which is knowing a lot of people, and what I think is community, which I define as being known by people. And unfortunately, I think in this day and age, it's modeled that as ministers of the gospel that we don't get to necessarily partake in the same 
benefits of the communities that we create. Mm. So where where you see all these ministers who are extremely lonely mm-hmm. and you think, how did it get to that place? Right. But they're not allowing themselves to be known by really anybody. They're living mm-hmm. a really separate life of, of how they portray themselves on stage and how they are living maybe they're lonely, maybe they need a friend, maybe they need somebody to go shopping with, do you know what I mean? And um, I told Greg when we started one here in Tulsa, I said, I said, I feel like for all these years I've been living my life like a chef in the back who's preparing this amazing meal, chopping the food, setting this exquisite table and everybody sits down, but I'm still in the back working Mm -hmm. and I never got a seat at the table and I told Greg I said if we're gonna do this we have to be a family Mm -hmm. we have to sit at the table we all have to partake of it and if you notice that is really the cry of this generation for their leaders it is and you know I that was you know kind of the precedent that was set yeah isolation and separation of the leader and um, you know, I know there was some decent reasons behind it. Totally. And things taken to the extreme, you mm-hmm. know, but <clears throat> there was some protection involved there because people were, you know, hammered mm-hmm. for being sure. normal or whatever. Sure. <clears throat> Pardon me. But so I, I understand some of it, but you're right. If there's not the real connections and the real relationships yeah. and the real life examples set before us then how do people really get how to live this out right and but, and it's like really for us even opening our home mm-hmm. you know the the thought of the practice pra- it says in bible practice hospitality mm-hmm. well that that means that it's something you have to practice it's not mm-hmm. easy to open your home it's not easy like to have people walk into your home and see for me uh maybe that is a little messy sometimes mm-hmm. or there's crumbs on the table or I'm mm-hmm. a human. Do you know what I mean? Right. There's a tendency to want to just even hide our, our humanity away. Right. Do you know? Right. To but- me, it's also, I guess like for us, it is the thought of, I think it's a necessity in leading this next generation. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because there has to be, you have to be able to, to find authenticity somewhere Mm -hmm. because we live in such a culture of, and when I talk about culture shock and coming back to the States and uh, just culture at large, there's so much gloss. There's so much hype that everybody realizes that like social media, like it's a mirage Mm -hmm. of the real. And, and even like, even like take it politically, you know, like the, the, uh, catchphrase that you always hear on the news is like fake news or whatever mm-hmm. but like one person's news is another person's fake news it's a thought of like what is true mm-hmm. what is real what is authentic and I think people are looking for like are you real mm-hmm. and so for us that means that we kind of just it maybe it bring maybe it's a little messier in some ways mm-hmm. uh, because it's easier to just kind of stay on your quote-unquote leadership platform and not have to engage a ton or whatever but like we just it's very easy to just be us because we're just us yeah and so come over to our house we're not having to think or stress about it and and i we just lead from a position of like from the beginning we don't have it all figured out and we're not perfect people Mm -hmm. so if you're finding that we don't have it all figured out and we're not perfect people we agree with you Mm -hmm. and now it just takes that argument off the table Mm -hmm. but it is a thought of like we want you to see like honestly like one of the things that we hear the most from our team uh, that was completely unintentional, that we didn't set out to do. It wasn't like part of a church planting strategy or anything like that. But it's when people come to us and say, you know, I think one of the things that's made the biggest impact in my life is watching how you are with your kids. Mm -hmm. And it, it will always be about stuff that we weren't even, it wasn't part of a strategy. It wasn't what was intentional. We weren't doing it. We weren't saying like, hey, let's just let people see how we raise it. Because we don't, to us, how we raise our kids is just normal. Mm-hmm. But it's something that we hear over and over again from our team is just like, you're setting an example for how I want it to be with my kids. Yes. Uh, and that's just a random example of like, I think just inviting people to do, and it's again, it sounds so cliche. What does that mean to do life together? But really it's like for us, community is just, I think it's going back to like, what is 
what is what do we even mean? I guess the other question I would ask is, well, what is church? Mm-hmm. You know, I think church is community. I mm-hmm. think like the body of Christ, and even as we're planting this, we're planting this church through the filter of we're not trying to build an organization. Mm-hmm. We literally, like the church itself, and I told you we're renovating this building downtown. We're, we're calling it a building downtown mm-hmm. because the building isn't the church. Right. We understand that. The church is the people. Right. But it's the thought of like, what does it look like to in our everyday life? Like, and I don't know, are people part of our church if they can't come on Sundays, but they're at our house for dinner on Wednesdays? Mm-hmm. I say yes. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit different. But at the same time, and the, probably our approach to church planting and being pastors, we're missionaries. I was going to say, that's why the Lord called you to do it differently, because there's specific things he wants you to do for the people he's called you to. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and, I think, and I think that when you go, like say if you go and you moved your family to go to like a quote unquote unreached people group in, in a tribe in the middle of nowhere, you'd go and you'd live with the people. Mm-hmm. And I think that, I think that we've forgotten that. Like right. we might, mu- we have to live with the people. We would be like that bridging, so you know what I'm saying? That is so good. Yeah. Can you we- imagine? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Exactly what you're saying. Like we hear these st- stories from great men and women of God yeah. from the past missionaries going into tribes and like, mm-hmm. you know, we know that we know these stories in our churches and it's like, oh man, they're going and it's into the Amazon and they're at this tribe. But their strategy wasn't, so I'm going to show up and build a building, and then I'm going to make them come in, and that's how we're going to do missions. That's how we're going to preach the gospel. Right. You, it wasn't limited to finding a location and having people show up to that location. Mm-hmm. It's great to have a location. I mean, and I've preached in churches and thatched huts around the world. You know, like the, it's, you have to have a space to gather. Right. But you need to be connecting with people outside of the gathering. So what I hear you saying, (laughs) which, by the way, if I'm accurate, I love, is that instead of putting on our Christianity, Mm -hmm. we be Christians. Right. Yes. All the time, everywhere, with everybody. Our, our, (laughs) Our tagline, our mission statement for one is reclaim the art of living. Oh, I love that. And the, <laughs> the, the thought behind it, what do we mean when we say reclaim the art of living? I think probably our international travels and working with so many different, you know, reli- working within the context of so many different belief systems mm-hmm. and religious views around the world. Uh, I don't think Christianity is immune from being just a religion. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, where Absolutely. it's like you, you know the right things to say, mm-hmm. you know the right language to speak, but you kind of miss the actual point, mm-hmm. the the gospel at, at large. I'm not saying everybody does, but it, you're, it's possible to live in a context where you know the rhythms and you know the practices, but the the I guess the revelation, yeah, of the reality. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So to me. Reclaim the art of living, the whole thought behind it is it really goes, it goes back to the point of creation. Mm. When God breathed breath into man, mm-hmm. when he breathed life. Mm-hmm. And that was the intention right there. God and man, man fully alive. Mm. And I think sometimes in Christian circles, we can be so mindful of the, you know, so say, so sin conscious Mm -hmm. and like okay we're all about the rules and what's sin and what's not sin and all of this stuff yeah but that was the like it's i think we should be life conscious sin the reason sin is quote unquote bad is because it takes away life sin produces death Mm -hmm. so instead of being so consumed with the rules that's right it's resetting us back to like, no, like the, the whole point, the whole gospel, the good news of Jesus coming is to reset to life. It's right. salvation. It's redemption from death That's and right. bringing life back to us, like right. the original intent. So like for us, when we say reclaim the art of living, what we're, what we're saying to our community, the people that are part of, um, you know, this new church that we're doing downtown is... 
I am more passionate about, I mean, it says this straight on our website. Mm -hmm. It says, don't just show up to church, show up to life. Mm. Because church isn't a thing you just go to. Right. Like Christianity, the gospel, it's something that's far broader than attendance on for an hour a week. Mm. And in fact, one of the things that I say all the time is like, when you actually think about the gospel narrative, like in the big sense of God, the creator of the galaxies, mm -hmm. you know, that when you just think about the vastness of what that means, that we've found no other life anywhere in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. But here we are on earth and we, not only do we exist and we're alive, but you know, we believe that God knows us and wants to know us and speaks to us. And we think about all of that stuff and what an epic like reality we're in the midst of to reduce that whole story down to like, okay, we'll make sure you show up for an hour a week. Mm -hmm. is just so cheapening to me mm -hmm. and uninspiring That's so when good. it should be like this is your like this is your life you were created right. for now mm -hmm. like what is it that like instead of me saying to people that are part of our community like hey like here's what it looks like to be a good christian you need to give x amount and you need to show up here and you need to serve here at church sure all those are great but that's like the bare minimum right. what do you how are you showing up with your family how are you showing up in your marriage how are you showing up in your community to me like, honestly, and I, I said this this last week in uh, our service, we're having services with our pre-launch team. I can't give my life to getting people to show up somewhere on a Sunday. I'm just not going to give my life to the thought of everything we're orienting is show up on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But if all of those that are showing up on Sunday are showing up on Monday, that is something that, like, I, to me, that's, that's the gospel. Yeah. The gospel is when you're, what, what is your life looking like when you're not in the service? That's really good. I love that. Me too. You have been listening to the FCF Leadership Podcast, where our focus is to help you achieve your destiny as a leader. Thank you for joining us today. For more information, visit our website at fcf.org.